Well, today's session, WWF One Planet Leaders, Leading by Example with Kingfisher. Thanks very much for joining us. We're pleased to have with us today Ian Schiffer, CEO of Kingfisher and a Maginot of WWF. Before we actually begin with the presentations, I'm going to go over a few technical instructions for the webinar. For technical audio issues, please use the chat box on the right-hand side to speak to me. Select from the drop-down menu and send me a message. We'll have a session at the end. You can question at any point during the webinar by typing into the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. And finally, please use the chat box to contact me if you'd like to use your phone to dial in. Now, the way, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our speakers. Are you there? Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And welcome, everybody, to the One Planet webinars. So, my name is Manuela. I work for WWF as part of the One Planet Leaders Team, which is training programs for business on sustainability and leading change. I'll be your host for today's webinar. You can see there are four themes in our webinar series, and the theme of today is leading by example. The Forum for the Future describes it very smartly. The sustainability movement has seen many pioneers. They were first the decouplers, the companies that want to grow their business while decreasing their environmental footprint. Then came the zero notes, a term coined by John Eltington, who will be our guest speakers uh, next month, by the way. And the notes are those businesses that are going for no impact, so zero waste, zero carbon, and so on. But recently, and pushing the bar even higher, a new movement has emerged. The net positives, they currently a very exclusive group, characterized by a state public desire to be a authoritative business, to positive contribution to the world's future. At the start of 2012, Kingfisher joined the select rent of the restorative sustainability pioneers by launching its new sustainability plan, Become Net Positive. And since Kingfisher's motto has been, better mean doing, means doing more good, not just less bad. But how does this work in practice? What does it mean for Kingfisher's business partners and consumers? And how can such a long-term ambition be implemented in the day-to-day -day business? To these questions, and probably many others that you may have, I have the great pleasure to welcome Ian Cheshire, CEO on Kingfisher. Good morning, Ian, and thank you so much for being with us today. Before I give you the floor, let me just share a few information about yourself. Ian Chai is widely regarded as a pioneer in the field of sustainable business. As he Kingfisher since January 2008, he has been outspoken in his view that the organization's whole business model needs to fundamentally shift. His vision of B&Q's customer renting power drills as opposed to buying them has captured imaginations and is widely used as an example of a mainstream business adopting a more collaborative approach to the product and service it provides. Fish is actually one of the 10 corporate examples that we highlighted in the WF Green Game Changers report. In 2012, Ian was honored by his contribution to the advancement of sustainability with the Guardian Sustainable Business Award for Leader of the Year. We are really delighted to have you with us today. I will pass over to you. I'll be back at the end to facilitate the Q&A session and tell you a bit more about our coming webinars. Well, can you hear me? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> Anne. Thank you, Ian. Welcome. Thanks very much. Sorry, it's the sourcing a little uh, mute. Okay, um, well, first of all, um, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, welcome to everybody uh, on the webinar. I'm going to uh, run through basically sort of four things. Um, first of all, it's sort of net positive uh, as an idea. Secondly, what we're doing and sort of how we're going about it. Thirdly, it's really some of the challenges and, if you like, early lessons learned, because we're less than a year into this, really, uh, and sort of where are we going next. Um, but try and run through that fairly quickly to really leave more time for the Q&A, which I think is, is probably sort of the value of uh, interactive session like this, rather than 
uh, inflict um, death by remote web-enabled PowerPoint. Um, so if we move on to the, um, <coughs> the first, uh, the next page, I'll just make sure technology works. Doesn't work. Excellent. <laughs> Trying to oh, and we may be pushing the wrong button here, but um, hold with us two seconds to see if it's a link. Go up there. Right, okay, fine, figured it out. Um, we've developed the net positive really as not a separate sustainability strategy. This is part of our core business, and it's really a new way of doing uh, an existing business. And in that sense, it features as a uh, subset of our overall purpose in, in Kingfisher, which we think is about um, creating, uh, allowing people to create better homes in order to give them better lives. And ultimately, everything we do as a business really has to fit into that purpose. That's the emotional engine with our customers that creates the business and the activity in the first place. And the net positive part is, is actually part of our eight-point plan for how we're going to develop a business. But it's part of the uh, cross-cutting theme of how we run our business, which is about creating an integrated one-team approach and a net positive business. So this is something that cuts across um, every every aspect and becomes part of our, our mission of day-to-day -day business. And it's really based on, I think, sort of the observations that we think we're at a, a juncture in the world economy and the model of capitalism, which means you can't simply have a negative, unsustainable business model. There has to be a long-term vision, possibly not something you can do overnight, but this thing must be ultimately, I think, restorative if it's going to be uh, around again. If we're a business that's 40 years old. We'd like to be around for another 40 years old. And it's really based on the sort of second um, belief, which is that we are in a sustainable um, planet consumption world. And we're working with the One Planet um, theme now since about 2005. And I think we recognize the reality of that and that if it, your business model doesn't recognize the reality of it, it will be uh, made to do so because we simply can't consume the, uh, the resource base of the planet at the rate we are. And finally, I think the motivational leadership challenge of Net Positive was the thing which persuaded us to go from, if you like, a sort of zero-naught sustainability view to, to net positive, because I think the key to this is engaging people both inside and outside your business to help you on the journey. We, we are not going to have all the answers. We certainly haven't got them today, but we do know that the way to get this to happen is to excite people with a vision that we can then find solutions. And this is about unleashing the human creativity of our teams, our suppliers, our stakeholders to try new ways of doing business in the future. And to be really engaging, I think you've got to have something which is a bit more motivational than doing less harm. So our point of view, this fits with a lot of our heritage, which I'll come back to, and our personal belief and my personal belief that, that we need to have um, a real leadership challenge if we're going to get change, and simply an incremental approach uh, will really get us there. So let's um, go to the next point. What we've then decided um, as, a, again, a team, we wanted to have a net positive impact, but we needed to think about where that would um, have its impact. And this really is a recognition that there are some things which we've described in this um, slide about our foundations, uh, like waste reduction, fleet management, electricity efficiency, which are all good, which we would want to keep on doing, um, but they're effectively disappeared into people's day jobs, run being specific areas of focus. And what we wanted to do was find the area where Kingfisher could have its major contribution. And this is recognizing, for example, you know, our uh, case collaborators, um, people like Unilever, for example, will know far more about um, palm oil. We don't really sort of feature in that debate. Um, but we have uh, a massive impact as, as a group on timber because we consume a forest the size of Switzerland every year and uh, a third of all our products contain some form of timber. So we really wanted to sort of highlight areas in which we could have a uh, major impact. And so four areas we've selected just to run through timber. Um, as I've said, you know, it's it's a, a core, core area, and it's, it's really where we've started, I suppose, back in the 80s um, with the FSC uh, movement. And so it, 
in that sense, close to our heritage, but we still think there's a lot we can do. Energy, where we know a big motivation for our consumers is to save energy and to get their homes um, uh, you know, heated and as efficiently and uh, cleanly as possible. Um, there is uh, innovation where we want to think about new forms of business model, new forms of product. And the final area is community. Now, community um, is, again, a obvious thing. We've got a thousand stores around the world. We are in lots of communities. Retail is a local phenomenon. Um, but actually trying to make that uh, and say, how can we actually you know, really make a contribution? And I suppose that the essence of net positive was to say you could have um, essentially conventional strategy, um, sort of sustainability strategy, which simply said, well, we're going to do good things in all those areas, and that will make us sort of less impactful. I think what we've found much more challenging and stretching is to say, well, actually, if you think about the net positive challenge in each of those, you go for in timber, for example, um, not just saying I'm going to have sustainable wood size, and we're, we've achieved that in the UK, the first to get there in the UK, but overall in the group we're only about 83% uh, fully fully certified sustainable. Could you go from that to being actually a contributor to net reforestation and create more supply in the future than, than, than there exists today by underpinning the whole um, value cycle in timber? In energy, yes, we want to save our customers uh, money through energy efficiency. Actually, the net positive vision is can we help our customers become net generators of energy uh, through micro-renewables or other means in their homes and actually give them the, the, the freedom from the energy companies, which uh, a lot of them tell us they're interested in. Innovation, instead of just saying can we innovate to provide, provide less harmful product, we're interested in trying to go further in particularly around closed-loop circular economy products where we can generally rethink the business model um, and move from a take, make, dispose to a circular way of making money, which, which is a quite a radical shift from a sort of conventional retail point of view. And for community, um, we really want to not just be a good neighbor and provide employment, pay our taxes, uh, but actually look at ways in which we can give skills back to communities and allow communities to connect. So initiatives like our street club uh, in the UK we're trying to connect local um, communities in, on the street by cell, but by them access potentially to shared resources. And again, if, if you've got a model of renting out the power tool, perhaps that power tool sits in a community chest um, as opposed to in a store which um, is, is less accessible and it's connected to someone in the street who knows, uh, has been on our DOI course uh, and knows how to use it and help you. So we, we think we've got in those four areas a longer term vision of how we might become net positive in, in terms of our impact and that that critically for us is very, very closely connected to our business model because if you're going to have sort of ambition, if it becomes a parallel strategy rather than your core strategy, it will inevitably come under pressure and, and there'll be a nice to have sense about it rather than something fundamental. And we think in all those four areas, this will be you know, very good for our longer term business and we're very, very un unequivocal about this. So uh, the timber um, net reforestation really secures our longer term supply chain. We think there's a potential real our bottom line of over 50 million a year if um, timber supply is, is squeezed and prices rise. We think in the energy area there is a massive new market. There's uh, over 70 billion euros in, in Europe of new market through green refurb and, and other initiatives which is a growth opportunity for us. We absolutely believe the product opportunities and new business model opportunities will be new valuing at much lower planetary impact. And again, we're already at over 2 billion of sales uh, under various certification programs at the moment, and it's an area of growth for us. And finally, um, on, on the communities, we think this is absolutely central to our ability to do business in the future. And we have some evidence that where we've got better local engagement with our local communities, we actually see better performance in those stores. So again, this has to, I think, <clears throat> be part of your business strategy rather than a sort of parallel piece. And it has to be grounded in the reality of your, uh, if you like, your future business models. And otherwise, the pressures on it will squeeze it out. So we've set this as an ambition. Um, but I think the thing I want to then move on to is that it comes out of our heritage, so it is a direct relation to where we started from. 
Um, so we've we've developed, I suppose, going back to sort of '91. I think the slide starts in '93 when we uh, were a member of the Forestry Stewardship Council. Um, in fact, we had created our timber policy back in '91, and I'm um, sort of bore people about this the whole time. But it started with someone asking us, "Where does our wood come from?" Um, when the current managing director said, "Well, it comes from a supplier, doesn't it?" Um, we realised that there, there was something actually out there in terms of the supply chain and ultimately an ecosystem which we suddenly had to become much more aware of. And I think what we found is the timber journey really taught us a lot about <clears throat> our ability to change our supply chain for the better, to reduce its impact and ultimately um, shift the industry supply chain. And so being involved on timber, we then got involved in uh, attacking toxins in paint and became the first <coughs> major so a retailer to label um, VCs, um, essentially volatile organic compounds and paint <coughs> and eliminate them from our formulation. Um, we then moved through a sort of series of other um, uh, initiatives, which I haven't got all of them on the uh, <coughs> pack here. But what, what's really taught us is that in particularly a complex retailer, we're selling 35 to 40,000 products in the average store. And there are multiple sets sets of initiatives that you, you need to pursue and um, need to find out a way of, of making a difference. And while there are common themes like recycling and you know, even then something as, as, as relatively down to earth as Brico Depot France, which is a sort of discount DIY player, we've now seen recycling in store go from 30% to 72%. Um, we, we've been able to find a whole set of opportunities for the business. And I think the um, learning is that this is something that probably will never quite be finished. Um, but what we have got is a lot of practice in a lot of different areas, which gives confidence that we can carry on developing this um, going forward. So I've <coughs> got a frog in the throat there. So moving on to <coughs> what we're doing, um, this is art that occasionally I think scares um, our management team, um, because if you look at the bottom line, it's got a time date um, which actually says 2050 to get um, to the end, and it's extremely unlikely, given public company chief executive life, that I will be around to see that. So we're actually starting on a journey um, that allows us to have a longer-term perspective, but also is realistic about how we're actually, um, how quickly we can um, get there. So what we're trying to develop now is a sort of phase set of approaches, and I suppose the um, I describe it in the first box is we've had a sort of conventional approach to date. We're now into a law piloting phase where we're trying to have a series of pioneering projects in different areas which allow us to learn and start to move. And, and this is essentially combined a long term architectural sort of plan as shown here with a series of rolling three year uh, more detailed KPIs and, and, and projects. But it's Essentially, saying we don't know quite a lot of the questions of how we're going to do this. We recognise that it will take us um, probably at least till 2020 to get to a sort of tipping point where we're doing more net positive things than not, but certainly not 100%. And the other message of this is that the evolution is somewhat different. We'll come back to the challenge country by country because the starting points for the various operations are, are very different. What this is. Um, Really, says we are creating a framework to make progress. We are, creating, although we, you could argue it's a top-down framework, we're actually creating a lot of room for the different rating companies. So, for example, Castrama in France, Brico in France, B&Q in China, to do different things because actually the relevance of some of these themes is is quite different. But we are then taking those and putting them into our three and four-year plans. So the strategic plans for the business include a net positive plan. And have measures that allow us to uh, really track that through. But the point of allowing people a certain amount of flexibility in how they do it is that this is very much about creating engagement on the net positive journey. And to do that, you have to allow people, I think, the room to develop and adapt a uh, broad idea to their specific circumstance. So one example would be the timber program in the UK is um, uh, clearly about uh, in pilot phase with um, bioregional and silver to create a working woodland, 10,000 hectares, where we will bring uh, effectively undeutilized woodland back into producing 
viable fuel, which we can then sell in stores, and by creating the end demand, we think we can then bring back <coughs> potentially uh, getting on for a million trees into sort of useful useful uh, production. Now, in Spain, by contrast, the issue is about forest fires and protecting forests or regenerating forests after forest fires. And Brico there have got a separate um, program which resonates with the Spanish team and the Spanish consumer. So we're very happy to see that and really a sort of learning culture which says we try a lot of experiments, we see what works, we then adapt it and move it forward. And by the diversity of the group, we think we can um, really um, encourage you know, a thousand flowers to bloom and, and for us to learn. Um, the thing that's important to stress is that's not just um, uh, the internal piece. Um, we believe very much that collaboration uh, is the key. Um, we've been involved in a lot of external collaborations um, actually from from the start, I said, back FSC back in the uh, 90s uh, there, other involvements with um, long-term involvement with business in the community, for example, in the UK, a lot of thought leadership work done with um, Forum for the Future and by regional, and recently with uh, Ellen MacArthur on um, circular products, where we're looking to develop a whole series of circular products, uh, circular economy products to uh, launch onto the market, a um, combination of that and um, uh, business model. So we, I think, can see ways and means of, of actually uh, really getting value from developing our thinking together. And the other thing is that it's not just the NGO community. We're also uh, working with um, other uh, leaders in sustainability to both learn from them, in some cases work directly with them on collaborative projects. So Mark Spencer in the UK operating on Start, which is about helping consumers start to live more sustainable lives through practical options. They've obviously done a lot of work on their swapping, uh, returning, returning used product. Um, with Unilever, we've uh, a lot of engagement around the new models of sustainable consumption as well. Uh, Walmart's uh, work on their supply chain, I think, has been um, extremely positive and done on new business models. So we actually, you know, without going to prison for anti-competitive arrangements, are trying to work with people who, in some cases, are um, somewhat competitive. Um, we did work recently with IKEA, in particular, on the timber, timber retail coalition to ban illegal timber from uh, the EU. Um, that's a classic example where actually the industry does need to work together to get an impact. So collaboration is, is really key to our success, and particularly with such an ambitious goal, we don't know, um, you know really uh, how you can do that on your own. So I think the mindset is is, is to be into collaboration from, from day one. Um, it's also important though, that there are some big challenges, and picking out three here on this slide, we, um, I think it's worth worth spending a few m moments on. Um, firstly, on the investor mindset, we're a public quoted company. Uh, it's about a seven, uh, six and a half, seven billion pound market value, and we are owned by the international investment community. In fact, most of it outside the UK. Um, we have definitely seen the social responsible investing (SRI) uh, community. Um, influence and are certainly better informed and better engaged and we've seen I think some, some good reaction from them but to say the, the biggest challenge um, certainly for me on this uh, this page is still explain to the investment financial community that a more sustainable business model is inherently more valuable so you should be applying um, basically a lower discount rate to a business model that we're around in 40 years than, than a take make and, and display model that might be proud of existence or, or just be uh, regulated out of existence in a shorter period. And there are some very early signs that the generalist investor community are beginning to worry about some of these things, um, but it's still very hard to, to talk to people about 20, 30 year timescales uh, if their average shareholding length is only six months. It's an area in which companies, again, need to collaborate, certainly the quoted sector, is help, you know, really the message across the investment community that this is something that we need to factor into our, our thinking. We need to be uh, very clear, um, or rather they need to factor into their thinking, and they need to be very clear there is a direct connection between sustainability and value. And maybe the way into that is by pointing out the downside risks of non-sustainable models. Um, if, if you're assuming that some of these natural resources are going to be around 
forever at the same price, you, you've probably got a bit of long-term business for a while. And second issue I'd point out is our diversity. We, we operate Europe and Asia, quite different footprints, quite different um, uh, pieces. In fact, when we had uh, an early development in Russia, we had a, a bit of a problem on some of our net positive conversations because there isn't a direct translatable word in Russian for sustainability. So the mindset's very different there. Equally in China, you've got some extremely different views about what sustainability is like. You know, they're very worried about pollution in cities. In Russia, they're worried about water, um, lead pollution in water. Um, but not really worried about energy efficiency in Russia because there's so much free energy sloshing around. So we've got to recognize that we're at different starting points. Also, we've got different starting points in terms of size of business. So that adds up to a picture, which is we, we've set broad themes, but when allowing businesses in the group to do their own thinking market by market, which we're then cross-fertilizing through the central team. Um, then the final area is, is, is this question about taking our customers with us. And I think this is, again, an area we, we need to do a lot more on. I don't think we're anything like um, as, as far on the sort of track as we could. We um, need to be very careful here that we talk to the consumers in the right language. And so for a lot of consumers, they really like the guilt tripping that certain elements of the, uh, the green agenda have, have imposed over time. Um, so for us, when we're talking, for example, about people's homes, talking about saving them money um, and saving the planet is the right way around, rather than saying they've got a moral, just a moral duty to do it, which they're sort of interested in. But you know that we are going to sell um, a lot of eco green refurb um, projects, not on carbon saving, but cash saving. So you know, we think we need to really understand um, how we can help them go through this sort of journey of why should they be aware of this, um, you know, the one issue at all, how they can actually play a role? Because there is a sense, I think, in a lot of consumers that this problem is too big once they understand it. And the third challenge is they need to really believe that we are doing something that they can trust. This isn't just <coughs> wash. Um, the, <coughs> the honesty about, look, we're trying to make money out of doing this. This is not... When a, when a world of charity, we are a business, but we believe we want to be a positive business. And being honest about how we're making money out of it is being, is being authentic about it, as opposed to doing a little bit of greenwash on the edges. And I think they understand you know, what the issue is, how they can play a role, and we're serious. Then getting them to engage and actually sort of play a role, um, I, I think, is potentially a huge motivating force for our business. So we, we have to take the consumers with us, and we know we have to make it um, very, um, if you like, usually and and real, and not sort of talking down to people, and not not assuming that they'll do it out of the goodness of their hearts. So we're trying to make this um, part of a job, and we've got some examples on this um, slide about how people are interpreting some of these issues and, and have done something. I have my probably of, of the lot there is, is uh, Sharon, our skip diver, which is a new new terminology, which is basically when we came in to work out how much stuff we were throwing out um, back door and just putting slightly damaged product into skips. And when um, Sharon literally was jumping into skips and finding stuff that we should never have thrown away, it really woke up the stores and the store operators to the, the potential opportunity. And the UK, uh, alone, we've avoided 13 million pounds of waste cost. So actually, skipping and, and the sense of let's let's think about the total system and, and how much we can recycle, reuse, uh, or repurpose, has that directly boost, um, boosts our bottom line. So there are, I think, great war stories accumulating. Um, there is sort of saying, you know, what, what are we doing in terms of what are the lessons? Um, I, I think we've got um, probably sort of three things I would really pull out. One, you've got to have leadership commitment from the top for this. This has to be something that people see has got commitment, uh, has got, if you like, CEO and senior team commitment. Um, secondly, I think you have to get this in the business, which means both into um, bonus structures, so rewarding people for this sort of behavior, and getting it uh, into the commercial fabric. So we've done things that have got short-term commercial issues, which we've we thought were the right thing longer term, like getting rid of gas patio heaters. Um, and I think 
really, you know, accepting that we were going to make money selling them, that that's the right thing to do for the longer term. And actually, if people want to be warm outside, they would feel um, kind of is actually probably a bad idea. And the final bit is is to really try and engage and, and educate as broadly as possible so that you've got people in the stores, you've got people in all levels of business thinking about, well, what more can we do? Because I think if you've got the leadership, you've got the engagement in the commercial reality of the business, and you're reaching into the broad teams, um, you will gradually unlock a whole set of actions, which is difficult sitting as a CEO in one office to sort of make everything happen. You really need the army of people uh, engaged. Moving on to what, what we're in, this is the, um, the bit of, of invitation. I mean, we are um, very interested in getting as broad an audience as possible to help us in this thought. Um, we've, uh, at launch and post-launch, really tried to encourage the idea of the conversation. We're going to be holding a sort of series of these quarterly with interested parties, external stakeholders, um, suppliers, and really try and find positive ideas, because I'm, I'm absolutely sure there is a lot out there that we can tap into relatively quickly. And obviously, it's easy if you've got a suppliers come to you with a great new circular economy product and you say, okay, how quickly can we get that into the stores? Or someone else has said, actually, I think you could do this around uh, energy or this around your community program. Um, we've, we've basically taken the approach that, that we will get uh, a, as an open attitude as we can and get all the benefit we can from an external um, uh, perspective. So there is a, a net positive conversation at kingfisher.com. If anyone there is at all interested, uh, we're extremely keen um, to uh, get every every bit of help we can because we know on a 20-day journey we're going to need an awful lot of help uh, to get pra practical solutions in each of those areas. So just to sort of um, conclude this part, um, we're very that net positive is, is a big ambition and it is something that's deliberately provocative, deliberately quite difficult to, to sort of flesh out all the details. But we have made it part of our strategy, made it part of the day job and the regular planning cycle. And that, I think, starts to embed it in, in, in the business. And, and the logic for that is this is going to be a better business if it becomes a net positive business. It will have a longer term uh, life. Um, it will be, I think, a business that will create new opportunities by having this different perspective. And I think we know that the growth opportunities Opportunities will only come by you know, reasoning, reframing the business, and the sooner we start doing that, the better. Um, we're also really clear, uh, and this is the, sort of probably the final point, that you can't do this um, on your own, and it's very important that we are connected fully internally as one team, but also externally in one network to try and do the best we can, because the ultimate challenge for a, a large-scale organization like us is making a transition and trying to work out how fast you can do it. So I was challenged to say how many circular economy products could we have. And I said, well, look, in five years, if you move from naught to 10%, that's you know over a, a, you know, about 1.5 billion of product they will have created that's in that area. And if you take, by comparison, how long it's taken e-commerce in the UK retail, it's gone from naught to about 10%, <clears throat> 11% of sales over 20 years. So big creations do not change probably as fast as we might like, um, but what we have to do is get the direction of travel right, which is what really net positive does. And now we're into the how do I take tests and start scaling it up and scale it up as fast as I can, recognizing that business has a responsibility uh, to do things in a, in a structured, solid, safe way. So we're off on the journey. I think net positive is the sort of ambition that, that you know, I hope many other companies will be doing. Uh, we've seen IKEA come out with Planet Positive recently, and I think there's an emerging, if you like, trend, as, as was uh, um, uh, Vanessa and others said at the beginning. I think um, this is going to be an important collaboration effort and a collaboration effort um, that's going to require a lot of ingenuity. But it's a fantastic ambition and one that we're certainly very proud of and very, very very key to both share and uh, get benefit from others. So that's the um, the end of the presentation a bit, and uh, we'll go to Q and A. And I think that's hope happened magically through some technological intervention, which I won't be able to do. So.
Thank very you very much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm here. I'm here. Thank you very much, Yann. Yeah. It was really, really interesting. And there's uh, already a few questions. And for for all the others, I just remind you that if you want to ask questions, just use the Q and A box uh, to ask these questions. Let's we'll start with the first one from Gavin Milligan. Mm-hmm. What are the relative impact of the BNU consumer profile changing in response to the One Planet theme as opposed to existing con- existing consumers change their mindsets? So my understanding of that is, do you attract new consumers that are, that are the converted, or do you convert your current um, audience, if you want? Mm. No. No, very good question. Uh, um I think two points on this is that I think you have to reach into more of your existing customer base who are not just the converted. And you know there are very studies on this, but you, there's probably you know, 30, up to 30 percent who are concerned and committed and interested and, and respond quite quickly. There's 40 percent who would like, if you make it easy for them, <clears throat> will join in. And there's 30 percent who are sort of in the active rejection. Um, for the for those in the UK, it's the Jeremy Clarkson contingent who you know will no more sign up to this and fly to the moon. But the big opportunity I think is the 30 plus the 40, and I think just talk to the converted that that's a, a potential mistake. And I think what we're what we're seeing is as we explain to people some of what we're doing, we're seeing a clear and direct um, brand perception benefit, um, and our challenge is to spend more money and time communicating what we're doing. Because um, otherwise, I think there is, there's a great danger of the, what my, one of my new favorite phrases that corporations have, a risk of um, green hush. So instead of green wash, the danger with green hush is you do lots of brilliant things and you don't tell your customers about them. And when they find out, they're positively impressed. And we've seen our quality rating for B&Q go up significantly when people understand our timber policy. So our challenge now is to really put the message across. And I think that will bring in new customers. Um, but the chances is we're already a mass market retailer, so we've got most of the UK and France and Poland already shopping with us. Um, so I'm expecting to, to mostly um, convert existing customers but also attract some new. But I think the key is we're going to have to do a lot more work on telling them about why this is important and, and also how their choices uh, can be a positive, again, a net positive themselves. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And there's quite a few questions coming on, so that's great. Um, the second one from Anne Gadgard. What change to business processes have you made in order to ca- cater for the net positive strategy? Um, I suppose bring out three, um, three levels of change. Um, First, put net positive planning into our regular three, four-year planning cycle. So that wasn't there, and so there is a requirement to act have a three-year plan of what you're going to do in this. Um, secondly, we've uh, embedded it in the various functional plans, and so there are some obvious areas which are relatively straightforward, like uh, our distribution fleet. Busily looking at efficiencies, busy trying to think about how they can switch to the forms of uh, lower impact distribution um, to commissions. In, in other areas, we're looking at um, certainly in terms of uh, timber sourcing, that the whole set of uh, certification work, which we you know, probably weren't doing um, five, ten years ago. So it varies massively function by function, but if you give the challenge to the function and say, how would you do things differently if you were going to engage with this? You'll get a better answer than a sort of somehow one size fits all. Uh, the third area is we're trying to uh, organise sort of innovation sessions to try and stimulate thought around entirely new business models and processes. Um, and that again is company money, but we're hopefully taking uh, an innovation fair approach to that. So at least twice a year we'll put together innovations in this area and share them with the rest of the organization. Uh, and I think this is really about trying to create a mindset which, which people say, right, we're on this journey. How do I start to change things? But it starts from strategic planning and then says, well, is that enough? What more could we do? And that's really the key intervention, I think. Does it mean that this is, and that's one another question from Mark Johnson, does it mean that this is... Uh, including the KPIs uh, of, of of the employees, and uh, is it 
in, in, in the corporate KPIs and is it uh, in your yeah. annual reporting? Yeah, we've uh, various levels of that. It, the short answer is, is yes. Um, the other element is that um, depending on how closely and directly involved um, it, it will feature more obviously in your own KPIs than, than for some others. Um, so frankly, up in our finance teams, it's not that obvious, whereas in the product or operations team, it's, it's very obvious. And corporate reporting-wise, we are setting um, everyone as KPIs and, and plans, because it goes back to the strategic plan point, and measurement against it. And uh, we've had a variety of debates um, for this year, and we're, we're actually literally in the middle of it now, trying to work out what level of this we can put into uh, basically the bonus targets, because without the bonus targets featuring something along these lines, uh, it's difficult. So, for example, I've had for the past three years the percentage of um, certified products has been one of my bonusable objectives, and it's have an impact because. You know, if you let other people know about that, then they don't particularly want to be the one that tells the chief executive he's going to miss out on some bonus because they haven't done enough work on certification of eco products. I think this is it's got to become evident through the organisation and be part of your regular management KPIs, and some of it needs to be part of the bonusable objectives. Mm, okay. And does it mean that you have developed a methodology to measure this net positive impact, or um, how do you do I, that? We, we are um, literally in the KPI planning session at the moment, and around the four um, key things are developing separate KPIs to reach them. So in some areas it's relatively simple. In other areas it's really quite difficult. And I would say we are in year of trying to develop this. But we've had a, a four or five history of quite a lot of different KPIs which we're trying to bring together and refocus. Uh, methodology terms, you know, we're not doing anything as complex as sort of the Puma P&L type approach, um, but we're involved in a lot of accounting and accounting for sustainability initiatives to try and see if there are other ways of developing new measures. But to start with, I think there are some fairly basic things like, you know, percentage of products sold, um, the level of impact on, on things like timber and uh, energy is relatively easily measurable. Uh, it gets much more difficult when we're setting targets for, for example, innovation. Um, but we'll be publishing those every year and sharing them, and I'm sure that's an area we can do with a lot of help from. So you, you share the methodology you're using with uh, every uh, publicly? Yeah. Okay. okay. There are a few questions around staff engagement. How do you communicate with your staff? And it's true, um, I mean, in, in the challenges, in, in the slides with the challenges you mentioned, investors and consumers, but yeah. with such long-term goals, how the staff kind of can relate to these goals? You say you, you might not be here in 2050. You're probably yeah. not, unfortunately, neither. So how, how do you manage to make yeah. them feel that they are part of it? Well, we're um, sort of bringing up a process of on internal communication now of uh, trying to just constantly uh, make sure everyone at all levels has an understanding of this and then depend on their role go more deeply or not. So in the UK there are uh, champions in each of the store who are the sort of, if you like, the specialists who are there to try and help tell the rest of the store about what we're doing and why. And this has to be done, I think, ultimately at two levels, one of which is, you know, we've got 80,000 people around the world, most of whom work in stores. They need to understand you know, what the ambition is, country by country, but also the broader picture. And that's just a, a non-stop process of trying to communicate. Um, we need to do more to support that by investing more in our public-facing communication because that makes it easier for, for them, the store staff, to get behind that. The other key area is in the particular audiences inside the sort of the corporate teams. So the commercial teams in particular is a really important piece of training for them that they, are, they absolutely understand what the local version of net positive means and where they're going. And I think that's, that's a never-ending process of um, constant you know, cycles of communication and then sharing success and explaining to people what's happened. So there will be, in, in, in every sort of major get-together, you know, an annual get-together of, sort of top 350 around the world, there'll be a specific focus on net positive, what are we doing to make sure people understand it. But it's really got to be there as part of the day-to-day, -day, you know, 
in the same we talk about sales, we talk about cash, what else are we talking about? We're talking about people, consumers, engagement, and positive. It, it's sort of got to be there as part of the everyday. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that engaging with the investor community is an important part of the journey. And has, uh, how has this net positive work impacted upon your share price? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, look, I mean, two things. Firstly, you can't um, simple sort of correlation of a sustainable business like this, and therefore the Z million further on the share price because there's so much, so much else going on, not least in consumer markets, which are uh, currently for us somewhat negative. Um, but I think that once, consu- once the certainly senior investors I've spoken to grasp the idea, they see it as an underpinning of value in the business. And I think is uh, potentially also as a leadership uh, challenge to get ahead of the curve on on these issues, seen as a potential future source of competitive advantage. But right now, I think the big problem for a lot of them is they don't know how to reflect it in hard financial valuation and actually ascribe the value to it. And so, for me, working with some of the areas around the investment community, accounting facility, and others to try and find new tools or ways of linking the value to the sustainability of your strategy, uh, I think is an important area because at the moment people are essentially doing double entry financial value, you know, uh, accounting based financial valuations of business and not capturing other elements, um, you know, natural inputs, the sustainability of the business model, the risks. And trying that broader picture, I think, is something we need to do a lot more work on because at the moment it's very hard to get that message across purely in financial terms. Mm. And you, I mean, do that they, they understand, I mean, do you have a strategy to engage your investors to make them understand what this is all about? Or, or how? We, we absolutely have, you know, from the launch last year, we're, we're saying this is a prime for for this year is to try and talk to our investors about what the longer future is. Um, and as a public quota company, I'm afraid we need to do both the day job and the long term job. So it isn't the only message we'll talk to uh, our investors about, but it's going to be much more visible. And what we're trying to really get across to people is the long-term opportunity is very good for our, you know, the, the health of our business, and these are the things we're doing and why. Uh, and I say, with the very odd exception, once people have understood this, they've said, look, this is absolutely the right thing to do. I, I'm not sure how, how I value it, but I'm, I'm glad you're doing it. Okay. Okay. How do you and your peer group, you say you were working with different uh, companies and, and sectors, how do you set the boundaries for what is pre-competitive? Hmm. Um, because I think this is fantastic. I think there's probably two things to this. One is there is some general thought leadership work. Um, so I'd specifically pick up, we were involved with m and and Unilever on models of sustainable consumption and trying to do some work with consumer research groups and Accenture, um, which is helping us get our thinking straight out where the opportunities might be and how we might start to paint a more positive picture. And that's led into, again, an initiative in the UK on the back of START, which we're trying to organize called START Today, where we get 30 major consumer brands to do a, a of their advertising which they would do anyway, but is around their sustainability during a month. And that way we get the product, um, if you like, the sort of product ads switched on to the sustainability message, um, but cumulative impact is greater than we could have otherwise. I think there are sort of if I, sort of coordination and thought leadership bits that you could do where it makes sense if the big brands and the big names are doing it. But the other is a very sort of set specific um, interventions around a theme. So we talked about timber. It's clear that unless people came together on timber, that that wouldn't work. Um, what we probably don't do as much, if you like, because we are trying to be a bit, bit more competitive, is um, you know in terms of product innovation, where I would probably want to get some competitive advantage by bringing these mar- products to market quicker. So what we're trying to do is say, look, thought leadership and broad um, industry leadership is absolutely sort of right place. Certain very specific initiatives need collaborative 
pieces, and then a large chunk of the rest of it, actually what we should be using is the natural competitive desire of businesses to be ahead of the game, and actually that will push the whole industry forward. Um, but it is, it, it's one we need to you know, think hard about. Yeah, I think it's really interesting for me because every time I hear like the real pioneers in uh, in that sort of field, they all say the same. And you've said it just before. You say we we can't do that ourselves. So there is a link between the level of ambition and the willingness to collaborate. And I think that's a, that's a really yeah. great thing. Uh, and of course, there are challenges to that. But it's it's good to see that um, that it's, it's happening at least. Yeah. What if one or two things would you have done differently in your net positive journey, if anything? So learn what are your key lessons. Um, I, in some ways, to be honest, uh, we're still at such an early stage that um, I'm not sure I've got any obvious sort of, uh, I would have done that a little bit differently. Um, what I suppose I can say is that we are fine process of, Getting into the detail of KPIs um, challenging, and, and it's and it's a non-trivial process. So if anyone else out there is thinking about how to do this, you know, give yourself enough time to really think through the detail of what KPIs you would go for. What does good look like? Um, but the other, I suppose, really big take is that it takes a lot longer to explain internally. Um, than one might think. So there's a danger if you're somebody sort of developing thinking like this and putting across, you sort of think it's blindly obvious and that you've explained it and people have got it. And actually allowing enough time to really, really communicate and over-communicate and keep telling people. And certainly Nick Folland here, who's uh, the, the uh, Net Pos uh, director of Net Positive for us, is spent life talking to the boards, talking to the uh, teams in the business, sort of get the message across, keep getting the message across, um, because it probably takes three goes before people get our heart and then start thinking, uh, actually, how would you do this and what would be the way forward? Mm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, another question, do you think cost reduction can promote more sustainable business? Um, mm. I think that for me the question is also in terms of customer um, Yeah engagement, behavior change, is it just saving money? Can you can you touch people I, on other things or, or I think it's I think it's very important to work with both consumers and organizations in a way that, that this is their interest and their power to get to the right outcome. So I think for businesses the prospect of being able to save money um, we take waste for example has has been a phenomenal driver for us. So let's use it, let's recognize however it is Say, you know, we are saving money and we are doing the right thing um, because I think if it comes purely cost saving, it loses its context. So I think you have to use use it in an and sense. And for consumers, I think very much the same message, which is if people feel that they can cut their energy bill and are doing something good for the environment, they're positive. I think what, what we've seen, however, in the last five years is saying, okay, I'd like a a more responsible product, but I'm not prepared to pay a premium for it anymore. You, the company, need to figure out how to make this happen. And if you make it easier for me and you make it cheaper, then yes, that's a benefit as well. Um, so, people, for example, all our kitchens are sustainably sourced wood. Uh, people don't go into the store to buy it because of that, but they like the fact that it is, and they respond to that once they're told about it. But I think you have to work with the costing as one of the key levers to get people aged around this, this whole agenda. Okay, well, thank you. And, and if I can ask a, a personal question, um, <laughs> how I, you are you are seen as, a, as I said at the beginning, you are seen as a pioneer. You are a leader uh, personally. What leads you to that? What what how the fire is in you? How has it started? What is, what drives you to do what you're doing? Um, uh, it's very hard to sort of pin down where, where I suppose, an interest in this sort of developed. Um, I suppose there were two aspects for me that got, got me interested. One of which is I, I was actually, I grew up overseas and I, in both in Africa, and I've sort of seen a lot more in some ways of the natural environment. And I went into the rainforest when I was eight or nine for the first time and, and really sort of understood the scale of what, you know, what we ultimately relied on. I think now I had a more personal, direct uh, connection, and 
Uh, growing up, I, I've just been very interested in the, uh, if you like, as a scientist, the scientific underpinning for this and the dependence uh, that we have on the environment. And gradually, through involved particularly with Kingfisher for 15 years, I've been able to sort of see a way in which businesses can actually have an impact on this. And it felt to me that the businesses that got it right would have a better long-term future and be more engaged with their teams buyers and customers. So it's always like a good business logic as well as a um, compelling, if you like, sort of values-based view of the world. But probably an early trip to the rainforest was, was pretty uh, important in triggering, uh, if you like, the awareness of the whole issue in the first place. Okay. Well, thank you for, for sharing that as well. I think it's it's really, it's really to, to, to say that you now, I mean, Kingfisher has a lot, lot of there's a lot of around this, and and that there is a there is a starting point to that, and the starting point is always some sort of sparkle or something that has trigger, um, yeah, some some sort of of fire in a way. So yeah, thanks for for sharing that. Um, I think we are coming to the end. I, there might be some question we haven't responded, and more than happy to forward these 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 questions to uh, Ryan later yeah. on. To, to respond, if if you're happy to to respond to that, would be really really brilliant. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to pick those up. I mean, thank thank you very much. There's been a lot of questions, and I think it was a really interactive and a, an interesting session. Um, so thank you for that. Okay. But, uh, thank you, Vanessa, for changing the slides. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so just to say that all these slides and uh, and the video of this session will be shared with you after the session. Um, where the information with everybody that has joined and 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 further away as well. So thank you, Ian, again, uh, and uh, welcome to come back to share with with us the, the result of all these uh, this great initiative. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Thanks for the opportunity again. Thank you. Just about what's next. So the next session uh, will take place on the 20th of March, and we will have the great pleasure to have John. Eltington, who is World Authority on Corporate Responsibility and Sustainable Development. So he, John will tell us his perspective, the emergence of a new form of thinking and leadership. So, um, I, I hope you will be uh, you will be several people to to join. And also a heads up on um, a Green Monday that will be organised in London on the 4th of March by WWF. The title is Gener Generation Net Positive and uh, Ian will be one of the keynote speakers. So if you want to, if you want to continue this discussion with Ian, and you have a chance to be in London on the 4th of March, I will invite you to join uh, this Green Monday, and we will have the link to to, to that also in our communication later on. So this is it for today. Again, thank you for joining, and we look forward to he, to seeing you again in our next session. Thank you and goodbye.